Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you. Uh, my wife Jeanette and I have indeed been here in Dubai now for one week and uh, we've been acclimatizing uh, and meeting people from all walks of life and all nations and just walking into the foyer of this hotel and seeing so many different faces and different accents. It really is a foreshadow of the heavenly reality, isn't it? Such a foreshadow that you get fresh baked pastries. Now that is quite out of this world. Uh, and whenever people visit Australia in Australian conferences, they really think the food is rather lame. And I know why now. It is such a joy uh, to join with you as we look at this portion of the Word of God together. What do you hope for? In life. A hope is anticipation. Hope is what you look forward to. And life is always filled with hope. Indeed, it is hope that makes you live on in life. Uh, when you start at school, you're hoping to make friends. A little later on, you're hoping to perhaps get a driver's license. And then after that, you're hoping to get to university and pass exams, and then maybe you're hoping to find a spouse, and then later on it's hoping to have children or grandchildren. And then perhaps after that it's hoping to get through an illness or hoping to, whatever it is, it's hope that drives you on in life. It's when people feel there is no reason to live that they are described as a people who have given up hope. People who survived the concentration camps of Adolf Hitler's Germany would say that what kept them going was hope. And the cruelest thing that their captors could do was to make them give up hope. This morning, we're going to look at the content of the hope that Christians possess. The new heavens and the new earth, the hope of righteousness, the home of righteousness that we have this guaranteed hope of. Now, I don't know how much you know about the book of Revelation. I'm sure many of you do. But please note that it is one letter to seven churches. The book of Revelation does not have an S at the end. It's not Revelations, right? It's revelation. Every time I hear the word revelations in plural, I wish I got one dirham for, and I think I'd be a very rich person uh, if I continued on living in Dubai. It's one book written to seven churches involving the victory of the Lamb, who is a way of describing the Lord Jesus Christ. The lamb who oversaw the seven seals and the seven plagues and the seven bowls of wrath and the defeat of the unholy alliance of Satan and his undying beast and his false prophet who sought to deceive God's people who were scattered in Babylonian-like cities like Sydney, Australia, like Dubai and the UAE. They tried to make his people give up hope, this unholy alliance. And as such, every believer, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian here this morning, we engage in a life and death struggle against the world, the flesh and the devil, whilst at the same time rejoicing in the fact that we have already overcome them in Christ. And we find ourselves in this paradox of the overlap of the ages. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead, he poured out his spirit from heaven and he ushered in this new age that overlaps with the old age, what we call or what the Bible calls the last days. And we find ourselves in this time that is, as it were, seemingly paradoxical of this overlap of the ages where we struggle against sin, but we know at the same time that Jesus has defeated sin. 
But one day, this overlap of the ages will disappear. One day, the tension of Christian existence will be resolved. One day, Jesus will return to judge his enemies and take his people home. And this day is so far beyond our understanding that it can only be described with word pictures that fill our hope in ways beyond our imagination. I want to show it to you from Revelation 21. So if you have your Bibles or if you'd like to open up to the middle of your outlines, please have a look there in verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. In some ways, it's a repeat of Chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Here is the new heavens and the new earth, the totality of a whole new creation. And did you know it turns out to be the bride, which turns out to be the holy city, which turns out to be the new Jerusalem. You see, here are three metaphors, three word pictures that describe the same thing. This is not meant to be a painting on a wall. This is very hard to draw. You can try and draw it, but in the end, it doesn't look quite right. Right? It's, it's word pictures that are on view. And in these word pictures, what you have are the same thing with different ideas. You see, it is firstly the bride that is this holy city. Now, if you're a husband, my guess is that you watch your bride walk down the aisle on your wedding day. And she was beautiful. I don't know what you look like, but she was beautiful. <laughs> and as she was walking down the aisle, my guess is that you didn't say, wow, what a great looking city. My guess is that you didn't say that, right? You look better than Dubai, better than Turkey, you know, whatever it is that you didn't think of your bride as a city, but the bride is the city. It's a city. The, the storyline of the Bible can be described as a movement from the garden to the city. This is not suggesting that people who don't like cities are likely to hate the heavenly city. This is a profoundly social vision of relationship. It is the new Jerusalem. Unlike the old Jerusalem and the Jerusalem that is existing now, which is sinful and was destroyed also in AD 70, and although in existence now was destroyed back then, it continues today under the high security with the tensions that we all know of. But it is a bride. A bride at the one same time. You see, just like a new married couple moves into a new home together, so God moves into a whole new creation with his bride, his church, his people. And this is the marriage we can look forward to. Human marriages, you see, are only ever a temporary institution. But what human marriages stand for lasts forever because they are only ever a model of the reality of the marriage between Jesus and his people, his bride. One person wrote, My favourite moment of any wedding is when the groom looks down the aisle to see his bride walk towards him. Apparently that's a line from that movie, 27 Dresses, if anybody has seen that movie. But listen to what this author says of that moment. He says, That moment reminds me of Jesus looking down the aisle of history to his church with the same look of love on his face. Isn't that beautiful? 
It is the unbreakable unity of the heavenly eternal marriage between Christ and his people that not only provides the foundation of our temporary marriages on earth, but the content of our guaranteed hope as his people, whether we are single or married. So if you are a single person, you are not missing out when it comes to the eternal heaven and the new heavens and the new earth. You will be married like I will be married. We will be married as a church, as the universal church to our Lord Jesus Christ. And what more do we learn about the bride? Well, have a look again at verse 9. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God its radiance like the most rare jewel like a jasper clear as crystal it had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates on the west three gates, and on the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. See, one of the angels now gets to parade the glorious bride. And what a bride! She is contrasted with the woman who is vividly described as the prostitute in chapter 17. And one new piece of information is here. This bride is the wife of the Lamb. She belongs to Jesus. And if you are not a Christian here this morning, please know that we who gather here as Christians are saved only by Jesus. What he did through his death and resurrection for us. When he died as our substitute, where all the anger of God that should have been poured out on you and me was turned aside from us unto Jesus, who is described in the book of Revelation as the slain lamb. And if we put our trust in him alone to be saved, we will be saved to be his bride, who belongs to him. That's why we belong to our husband, the wife of the lamb. And she also is described as the holy city, sharing the glory of God, verse 11. Has a wall, verse 12, a very high wall. It's very interesting, isn't it? Why do you need a wall in the new heavens and the new earth? Why do you need a wall in heaven? It's not for protection. It's a symbol of security. The wall has 12 foundations representing the 12 apostles, the 12 gates in the wall with the names of the 12 tribes, just like the city in Ezekiel chapter 48. So here is the entire unity of the people of God as represented under the old covenant and the new covenant, totally secure in the Lamb, blazing with undiluted glory. And furthermore, we read in verse 15, verse 15, and one or the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 studier. Its length and width and height are equal. You see, the angel now measures the city just like John measured the temple in Revelation chapter 11, and just like a supernatural being measures the temple in Ezekiel chapter 40. Because to measure something is an act of ownership, isn't it? When you moved into wherever you live now, my guess is at some point you got out a measuring tape to measure things so you can know whether the cupboard could fit here or the bed could fit there. And is that right? Is that what you did? Uh, that's what we did when we moved into our apartment in the city we live in in Australia. We took out a measuring tape. And that showed that we were owners in some sense. 
right? Yeah, I know you might be renting, but go with the idea. <laughs> it's, it's the idea of ownership in some sense, isn't it? And that's what's going on here. And having this secure ownership, the city, we learn, is a shape after measurement of a perfect cube. It's a perfect cube. Where in the Bible do you have a perfect cube? Can anybody think of where? You're all murmuring a little bit. Where do you have a perfect cube in the Bible? Outside of this book. Ponder it. It's in the tabernacle, the temple. It's actually in the Holy of Holies. Why the Holy of Holies, that, that most sacred part of the temple, is a perfect cube. And now the whole city is a perfect cube. The bride is a perfect cube. See, it doesn't mean that the bride is not good looking. But it's the city that is a perfect cube. And it's 12,000 studia, which is 2,400 kilometers. That is roughly the distance between Dubai and Cyprus, if you can picture that distance. That's a long way, isn't it? But what we have here, again, remember, it's word pictures, a perfect cube, the most holy place in the temple and tabernacle. This is the place where God had created direct access to himself when the high priest entered once a year with sacrifices on behalf of the people. And now all the people of God, all the people of God have direct access to him because of the priestly work of Jesus when he sacrificed his own body on the cross, when he died the death that you and I deserve and rose that we might have life. And if we trust in him alone, we too can have this direct access. It's not through our religious deeds that will do that. It's not by praying more or reading my Bible more or even going to church more. You see, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Now, going to church is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But the going to church is what you do as a saved person. It doesn't save you. What saves you is the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has given us direct access to himself in this new creation where all of us will be in the presence of God and of the Lamb if we trust in him and him alone to save us. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, we can look forward to this access because of what Jesus has done. Every lustful thought, every thoughtless word, every selfish act that should prevent any access to God now dealt with through the blood of Jesus and his resurrection where the search engine into our lives is erased as far as anything displeasing to God. And the wall of this cubic city is built of jasper, we learn. And the radiance of God's glory is likened to jasper in verse 11. The city is soaked in the glory of God like dye soaks into clothing. And the foundations of this glorious wall representing the twelve apostles are adorned with all these different colored gems. Jasper again, sapphire, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, jacinth, amethyst. And that's all an allusion back to Isaiah 54 verse 11, I think. And they're all spectacular. There's also a reference to these jewels on Aaron's breastplate. Aaron was the priest, right, in the Old Covenant in Exodus chapter 28. And they're all representing the people of God. I take it that's why this is kind of alluding to here in this new heavens and the new earth, where each gate is a single pearl. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? wonder if anybody here 
Raise your hand if you've seen the crown jewels in London. Hand, raise up if you've done that. Yes, handful of us have. I've never been there, but you might want to ask these dear friends about what it's like to look at the crown jewels. I've been told that what you do is go on some kind of uh, moving, what do you call those things here, an escalator? or No, that's a thing that, uh, anyway, a moving thing, right? On a trevelator, and it's kind of built. And then as you do, the, the crown jewels are there, which is the jewels that belong to the royal family. And our dear Queen Elizabeth II uh, used to wear some of those jewels, and King Charles will at some point in time, and whatever you think of the monarchy, these jewels are quite spectacular. And I'm told that as you move along, you look at these jewels and they start to sparkle in all sorts of ways and you turn your head and they sparkle in all sorts of ways that, that make it look incredibly magnificent. That's the kind of thing that is on view here that is it's so spectacular. It's unbelievably glorious. As a, a hymn puts it, it's ineffably sublime. But the Queen of England... Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away, did actually trust the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Saviour, and she is now enjoying better jewels of the new creation that she will indeed enjoy when it comes, but she is enjoying jewels that will be better than anything that she has seen in this earth. But there will be things missing in this new city. Did you pick that up? Have a look at verse 22 and following. Verse 22 of Revelation 21 and following. And I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light and its lamp, the Lamb. Verse 25. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, I did this at the student conference, and I'm going to be brave and ask you to do likewise. I'm going to ask you for a moment to look at those verses again in verses 22 to 27 and answer this question, what is missing and why? What is missing in verses 22 to 27 and why? And here's the brave part, okay? I'd love you to talk to your neighbour about it, the person next to you. Do you think you can do that? Can we do that at Redeemer? Yeah, can we have a go? Great, let's do it. And say hello to the person next to you who haven't already. And then ask them, what's missing in these verses and why? Can you just talk to each other for a moment? Go for it. I'll give you a minute. I'm so generous. Okay, I might get you back together again. You know, ordinarily, if, if there was a smaller group of people, I'd get you to call out. Uh, but uh, in a group of, I understand, a thousand chairs or something, it might be a, a little um, 
challenging to do that. Uh, I do hope the tech people were talking up there, not just doing tech things. You guys are doing that. I hope you're doing that. Shame on you if you weren't. No, no, I'm joking, joking. There's nothing more wonderful for someone who teaches the Bible than to hear people talking about the Scriptures. I know Dave must be just lifted. My heart is lifted when I'm hearing you murmuring and thinking through, what does the text actually say? Right. And I will repeat what it is that Dave heard me say all those years ago, that we really want you to li- wrestle with the text of Scripture. And my job is to get out of its way. Right. Your job is to look at it. And, and please note that when we come to the Scriptures, I want to use this word, we, we're actually doing comprehension. Uh, I'm trying to actually avoid the word interpretation. I know people use that word. Because when we use the word interpretation, often what we mean by that is, I will desire what meaning I want out of the text. You know, we look at a piece of art and we think, I'm going to interpret it, and it means this for me, because that's what means best for me. But that's not what we're doing. We're comprehending what the author intended. And that's what you were seeking to find out. Right? I wonder whether, like me, you discovered some of these things. Right? There's, there's no temple, is there? Hands up if you saw that, no temple. Great, we're on the same page. There you go, comprehension's great, isn't it? Yeah, we should do more of that. There's no temple in this city. Why? Because on earth, the temple of the old covenant was where God manifested himself in a mediated fashion, and now God and the Lamb are its temple. We have direct access, so we don't need a temple anymore. That's why there's no need to go back to Jerusalem in order to access God. We have direct access to God through Jesus, who is now the temple. There's no sun. Did you pick that up? Hands up. You've got no sun, no moon. Yeah, yeah. See that there? Now, that's not a comment on cosmology. Right? Any more than not having any sea in the new heavens, new earth, was a comment of hydrology. <laughs> now, there is no need for secondary light anymore. All our light comes directly from the glory of God. He gives its light. No night either. Why? Because night is a symbol of danger or evil. And note there's no shut gates. There are gates, but they're not shut. What's the point of having gates that are not shut? But the idea is that there's no danger, there's no sin, there's no curse, there's no impurity, there's no idolatry. Imagine a place like that. I don't know where you park your cars on the street or in apartment complexes or outside the villa, but my guess is you lock your cars, don't you? You won't need to do that in heaven, whatever we drive in heaven. I don't know what we'll drive, but it'll be fun to know. Heavenly cars, clouds maybe, I don't know. It might have been amazing. But there won't be any danger. And no one impure or unclean will ever enter. See, there's things that are missing in the new creation. But look what is there, or rather, I want to say, who is there? Look at verse 23 of chapter 21. Verse 23. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The nations. See, who are the nations and kings? What sense do they bring their glory into? The nations are the people that were described actually back in Genesis chapter 10. Do you remember who is on view in Genesis chapter 11? Does anybody remember who, well, who's on view in Genesis chapter 11? There's a, something a little tall in Genesis 11. The Tower of, say it with me, Babel, the Tower of Babel. And that's where the, all of humanity gathered, spoke in one voice, wanting the name for themselves, and God comes down. He has to come down to this puny, puny thing. That's, the thing. that's what's going on with what is the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. And God scatters them and gives them different languages. But, but, but chapter 10, 
is probably chronologically after because it talks about the nations. But the reason chapter 10 is chapter 10 and not chapter 11, I think, because I think chapter 11 is a flashback. But what was always on view is what God said of the nations. Let me read out to you uh, some of the verses in Genesis chapter 10. But if you've got your Bibles, have a look at Genesis chapter 10 and verse 5. It says, From these the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans, in their nations. Likewise, in verse 20 of chapter 10, of Genesis. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Or verse 31 in Genesis chapter 10. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. And then the summary verse in verse 32 of chapter 10 of Genesis. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Although the Tower of Babel is in chapter 11, it probably happens historically before chapter 10. It functions as this flashback, as I mentioned before. And so what we have in chapter 10 is a foreshadow of what God had in mind all along, for the nations to be blessed, as we hear about in the promises to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. The nations were always in view, and here in Revelation 21, all the nations walk by the light of the glory of God and the Lamb. That's why it's just a spectacular foreshadow to see the nations represented here this morning. I don't know how many languages there are. My guess is 40, 50 last time I heard. Different accents, different languages. This is my guess. I don't know if it's true. Don't burn me at the stake if I'm wrong on this one. I'm happy to be wrong. But this is my guess that our ethnic distinctions and languages will not actually be erased in the new heavens, the new earth. Because the nations will be there. You see, perfect multiculturalism doesn't exist on earth. And we know that, don't we? Because we, we can't share the same values It's just very hard to, unless there is one God whose values we share in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the new heavens and new earth, there will be perfect multiculturalism embodied. Won't that be wonderful? So don't worry if you don't know another language yet and it's too hard. You've got all of eternity to learn another language. There are many languages. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And God will be exalted among the nations. And then we come to the very center. Would you believe there's more? At the very center of the vision of Revelation in chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There is a river. Isn't it interesting that Dubai created another river coming through? There's something heavenly about that. There is a river, the water of life in the new creation, which flows down the middle, and that is a picture of Genesis chapter 2 and Psalm 46. And there is a tree of life. Again, an allusion to Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, but this time there's 12 kinds of fruit on either side. In other words, all that there is of life, fruitfulness, glory, vitality, healing comes from the one place, the throne of God and of the Lamb. And no longer will there be anything accursed, verse 3 of chapter 22. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and the servants will worship him. Uh, Nothing... Nothing will be cursed unlike the creation back in Genesis 1 and 2 because the throne of God and of the Lamb is at the center. Please note, therefore, that back in Genesis 1 and 2, it was not 
perfect. Think, what? This guest preacher should be, well, not invited back. <laughs> but, see, it depends on what you mean by perfect. Perfect means you can't get better then, doesn't it? Say so it's perfect. You, it can't get better. But you can get better than Genesis 1 and 2. It's called Revelation 21 and 22. That's perfect. What we're looking at here now is perfect. You can't get better than new creation, but the new creation is better than Genesis 1 and 2, do you see? And look how much better it is when we come to verses 4 and 5 of chapter 22. They, the people of God, will see his face. Adam and Eve didn't see the face of God. No one actually could see the face of God. When they tried to see the face of God, they, fa they saw face to dirt in the end. They, they had to bow down before God. Now they will see, in the new creation, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more and they will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. See, what makes heaven heaven it's not so much reuniting with loved ones. What makes heaven heaven is seeing God face to face in undiluted glory, where we will see him and not die, where God will dwell with his people. And you've been following the theme all the way through the Bible. That's the big point. His people have not been able to dwell with him and he took the first move at every single point to enable us to dwell with him somehow to the point where Jesus dwelt with his people in the person of a one who is fully human yet fully God who had to die for us and rise again so now we can be dwelling with our God only because of what God did in the person of Jesus. The wonder of the new heavens and the new earth is all about the God-centered, spectacular glory of seeing God face to face. If Jesus was not there, heaven would be hell. But Jesus is there. And with this spectacular view, the, the content of our hope in mind, we need to keep that as our hope as we live in this world with the overlap of the ages where the world rolls on in judgment with wars as in Ukraine and rumours of wars between China and the US, of famines in Yemen, floods in Pakistan, pandemics that we have all lived through awaiting this new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And how are we to live in the light of Revelation 21 and 22 now? Victoriously is what I want to say. Because Christ has conquered and he extends his conquest in the lives of his people by putting the global church in the midst of an apocalyptic war before that day. And this warfare is not just out there, it's also in you and in me and as our sinful nature struggles with the spirit if we are Christians. It's our fight against sin, the world and the devil. And Jesus' commands to the seven churches translate the cosmic battle into our experience as the people of God in this church at Redeemer and the daughter churches from Redeemer. The struggle is hard. The suffering is great. And my guess is you know that. You know that, don't you? We're sure we're gathered in large numbers here and, oh boy, the croissants are amazing and, and life is just wonderful and we're looking good and smiling and so on, but there's hurt, there's pain, there's anguish, there's hardship, there's challenges, and they will continue. But we live in hope as victorious Christians in these last days. As one person put it, being a victorious Christian means holding firmly to truth but weakly to power. Humbly entrusting ourselves to God and gently speaking the gospel message 
to all. And it means lamenting when life is hard, when we go through the anguish of hard times. It means leaving vengeance to God when we have been the victims of hurt and pain caused by others. It means telling him our pain and entrusting that pain to him and trusting that the world will see God through our weakness as we stubbornly refuse to lose confidence in his love even when he seemingly remains absent from our lives. See, this is a life through which God's glory will shine. It is a life through which the humble will see God and the heavens will praise him. It is the life that will continue to look forward to the new heavens and the new earth that's just been described. A life when we can look forward to a time with guaranteed hope, when there will be no more tears, no more pain and no more anguish and no more hatred and no more sickness and no more death when we will eat from the tree of life not be hurt by the second death be clothed in victory sitting with god on the throne and seeing him face to face dear brothers and sisters are you looking forward to that day Let's live in the light of it, in hope. For Jesus has died and risen again. And he is our hope. He is our future. He is our life. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ who has given us direct access to you because of his life and his death and his resurrection alone. We pray for those of us here who are still thinking through what it means to be a Christian, that you'll please help us to see Christ and to trust him alone to save us. And for those of us gathered here as your saved people, please keep us looking to Jesus who for the joy set before him endured the cross. As we wait in hope for this new heavens and the new earth, the home of righteousness. And live this life victoriously in his death and resurrection through the struggle, but knowing that he is Lord. And we pray this all for his glory. Amen.